Dee, how close are you, Dee? You good? I think we're pretty close. It's 701. You're good? All right. Bob, are we live? We are not live on YouTube, but you are live so people can call in, people can zoom in. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna call the uh Planning Board meeting of Wednesday, April 13th to order. You good, Didi? Okay, so first up is agenda continuances modifications. Leon? There are none. Okay. Next is the uh, approval of minutes for the Planning Board meeting of March 9th. What is your pleasure? Make a motion to accept the minutes as written. Second. So Mr. Harding has made a motion. Ms. Wilson has seconded. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Chair is abstaining because he was absent. All right. Onward. Item number three uh, is applicant Church Community Housing Corporation, owner town of Portsmouth, AP 23, lot 2, 110 Bristol Ferry Road. I do have one correction. This is not a concept plan review. This is actually a pre-application conference review of a low or moderate income housing development, LMI. So it looks like Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, we, we changed that on the, uh, the Secretary of State's website. It does say pre-concept. Uh, Perfect, thank uh, you, Mr. Crosby. So Mr. Chappelle. Could you just make sure your mic's working there, Court? Oh, there's a green light. Perfect. Thank you. So in talking to the solicitor, he has, I believe, given an opinion that we are here based on a comprehensive permit. So what normally happens if you have an apartment complex is that that would fall under Article 7, Section C of the Portsmouth Zoning Ordinance. And the exclusive jurisdiction of that would be the Portsmouth Zoning Board under what we call a special use permit and the A through J criteria of meets with the comprehensive plan, compatibility with the neighborhood, traffic hazard, other types of considerations. Whenever there is an LMI component to it, there is then a number of things that we have to satisfy, a number of individual requirements. But we're really here because the government says that we need 10% LMI. There had to be a fast track, if you will, for what's called a comprehensive permit so that developers that were going forward with LMI that would often be met with not in my backyard type arguments would have a remedy to not only go quickly and not get caught in the quagmires of what can happen uh, between a number of town boards, but also have a special appellate process so a fairly limited reasons in the way the board can turn things down, not necessarily because neighbors don't like it and it affects the neighborhood like you do in zoning. So there are specific requirements. We also remind you this is a pretty unique petition because the land is owned by the town of Portsmouth. You know it as the senior center and the baseball field. It has been one of the town's biggest either, I don't wanna say controversies, but issues. Uh, we all saw the signs in what to do with the senior center, how to preserve the senior center, and what effect, if any, the development of this into an LMI project would have on that. And there were meetings and committees, and Mr. Belden from Church Community will tell you that with a great deal of compromise and a great deal of discussion, finally before the council, it was put together that the senior center will exist on these premises with LMI housing which stands for low to moderate income, of course, but this particular low to moderate income housing, trying to get to the town's 10% goal, that 10% of our housing is available for LMI, would be limited to the elderly. And there are obviously nice advantages to the town to meet your 10% with elderly housing uh, because of the need for elderly housing and the relatively low tax on the services and relatively low tax on things like the school system. You also remember most of us that voted in town, we had a choice on a referendum 
because under the town charter, the town cannot sell property or enter into a long-term lease unless voted on by the public. And it was voted on by the public, but before it went to the public, this group of people that you're gonna hear from tonight had to give this entire presentation to the council, show them the building, commit to the units, commit to the senior center. And the referendum that passed says that it has to be presented to you in substantial compliance with what was given. We can't add 10 units because the referendum said, no, this is what you're pitching. And we, you're allowed to enter into this ground lease as long as there's substantial compliance. So we certainly are obligated and have committed to presenting just that, which was approved by the council to go to referendum and then ultimately approved by our citizens. So with that, I'm gonna start by introducing Christian Belding from Community Housing, who most of you know. He then will introduce your team. There is a presentation. There is relatively brief tonight because it isn't testimony, it doesn't count. It's just, we wanna give the courtesy of saying to you guys, this is what's coming forward. And if there's questions at the end of this, there could be technical review that you might want. There could be specific data, traffic counts that you want. And we can decide that when we come before you with the formal application soon, we have all the information you've seen and you've said, well, I reserve my right that I might want more later, but based on the preliminary, I think I'd like to see this and I think they'd like to see that and it will keep us moving and more organized. So with that, Good evening, members of the planning board. Thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, I'm Christian Bell. Yes. Name, address for the record, um, just because we got folks listening to those. Thank you. Yep. I'm Christian Belden. I'm the executive director of Church Community Housing Corporation. My address is 6 Newport Ave in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, as uh, court has given you the, the overview of this is a development uh, which represents a partnership between the town and church community housing. We were approached by the town um, because of the, the challenges to the existing senior center facility relative to fire code issues and the uh, reduction in capacity and long-term expenses related to uh, maintaining and improving that facility. And so we were asked to see if there was something that we could do to save the senior center at that location and also to meet the town's uh, needs for affordable elderly housing. Um, we pretty quickly realized that uh, we, we thought that we could um, assist the town with achieving those goals because there is a natural marriage between a senior center and senior housing in that many of the same um, amenities and common spaces that exist in your typical senior housing development are also the same spaces that exist in a senior center, your dining room, your library, your um, multi-purpose space. Um, with very few exceptions, as we did the analysis of the spaces that existed in the senior center uh, and compared them to the spaces that we've built in all of our other senior housing developments, there were just a, a handful of, of spaces that were sort of atypical the thrift shop offices for the senior center staff. Um, and, and so, you know, we thought uh, we, we can provide the town with a new modern senior center um, of the same size that currently exists in a new facility connected directly with uh, 54 units of senior housing um, of which we anticipate some of the, the existing senior center members may become residents uh, of this proposed housing development, and that um, this, the senior center uh, director and board of directors have said that they are going to welcome the new residents as new members of the senior center. Um, furthermore, we uh, identified the goals of saving the historic Ann Hutchinson four room schoolhouse and the existing ball field there. Originally, when we were uh, had initial preliminary discussions with the town. Um, you know, it, we were told, well, if you need to develop the entire parcel, then we don't really need that ball field. 
But then I actually learned talking to court that, you know, every Saturday that that ball field is used uh, for Little League. And um, and we really love the idea and not just us, but there are many studies that show that that kind of mix of populations having, you know, seniors uh, living at a place where you have children playing, you know, Little League, um, it, it is a, a good mix of populations, not in terms of who's housed there, intergenerational mixing um, generally is problematic and we're not proposing that. All of the housing that's proposed in the new facility would be restricted to um, seniors 55 years of age and older. The only small caveat to that are the six units that are proposed for market rate condos to save the, the Ann Hutchinson four room schoolhouse. But we believe that um, the best practices show that having a, a ball field on site with children uh, you know, playing little league creates a, a really great environment for both the, the seniors who will be living in the housing, who'll be able to look out of their apartments and see the kids playing, to be able to come down and, and you know, sit in the bleachers and, and watch the ball games. Um, and uh, you know, so the proposal that you have before you is really uh, the representation of all of the work that went into creating this plan in consultation with the town appointed senior center advisory group, which consisted of the executive director of the senior center, the president of the senior center board of directors, uh, the DPW um, head, uh, Brian, um, the president of the town council, the vice president of the town council, members of the senior center, um, Gary Crosby, the town planner. Uh, and, and so, you know, we worked very diligently to come up with a plan that, that addressed as many of the town's goals uh, as possible understanding that the senior center was the, um, the, the focal point and the, the goal that at the time, you know, and continues to be, you know, what most of the residents in town are focused on and that we really needed to ensure uh, we were uh, meeting or exceeding that goal uh, completely. And so um, as uh, Mr. Chappelle has alluded to, um, we went through a referendum, the voters approved the referendum granting authority to the town council to enter into a long term ground lease with us, which allows us to develop this. Um, this development, um, but the option for that ground lease explicitly states that the ground lease is contingent upon the approved development being substantially similar to the one in the conceptual. Uh, design plans, the plans that uh, were presented before the referendum to the town voters, the rendering of which was on the signs that we put out before the referendum vote. And, and so, you know, both church community housing and the town um, really need for this development to move forward substantially uh, as it exists now, because that is the plan that the voters have approved. It's the plan that uh, I think addresses the goals of the, the town and all of the different interested parties um, as well as possible. And so, you know, we, we hope that um, you'll have a favorable consideration of this plan that we have worked very hard on up until this point um, and which we believe happens to uh, have materialized at a fortuitous moment in time with a funding environment which is more favorable for this development than it may have been in the last two decades at least. So one thing sitting as a zoning board is that there's building setback requirements, building height requirements, building story requirements, lot coverage requirements, density requirements, all which exist not only in the special use permit section, Article 7 of our ordinance, but also in Article 19, the LMI. And if it's not specifically referenced in LMI, it goes back to Article 7. So when we get before you, we'll be able to tell you, 
this is what the setback is supposed to be under the ordinance. This is what it is. This is what the height under the ordinance is. This is what it is. Remember that every time we need a variance, that variance has already been brought to the attention of the council, not that it binds you, but it, it's nothing new and it was included in the referendum. But we know there's a couple of variances because anywhere in town, for instance, you can have a whole height requirement of two and a half stories and this is three. And it's three stories with a architectural roof. So we're getting the, the exact numbers because it depends on the grading because as you know, you go from existing grading, but there'll be some of that. Uh, the density is X square feet per unit. And I believe at the council, it was suggested that that may only allow 40 units as a matter of right. We'll give you the exact math, 234,000 square feet worth of units and you're higher than that. But the competitive market of financing and the, in conjunction with the town, we're spending extra money to build you a senior center. So it has to work from a financing and marketing point of view. That dictated the three-story 54 unit building. Um, so you'll, where there are variances, we'll point them out at the full application, but you have the right to vary them in accordance with the LMI ordinance that specifically gives you the right to modify the provisions of the ordinance and the modifications of Article 7, if not specifically listed in the LMI. But we'll point that out to you. We'll also point out what's called the A through J criteria of what you have a standard and I'll print that up for everybody. Um, and then the LMI has another list uh, of specific things, including normally that 10% of the units in a building must be LMI. This is 90%. This is all but the six units that are in the Ann Hutchinson building. And if you ask why they're not elderly housing LMI, it's mainly because that old building is two stories. Elderly housing needs elevators. Elderly housing does not use stairs. Those have to be townhouses or they'd be just economically not possible to fix that old building. And that makes those more conventional and not limited, right? Yeah, it's, it, it's really um, the, the cost of converting that the historic four room schoolhouse um, to affordable elderly housing would just be too high on a per square foot basis to get the funders to um, be willing to, to commit the, the funding necessary. Um, there's just an economy of scale with new construction, with the number of units that we're proposing in the new facility that gets the construction cost per square foot down, particularly because you're talking about uh, a brick building um, that's historic um, and that in many cases doesn't meet current building code. And so the, the structural modifications, um, just everything involved when we looked at it, it just was not um, feasible from a cost standpoint. Uh, the only way that we think that it can be feasible to um, renovate and rehab the existing uh, Ann Hutchinson School Building is to convert it to market rate condos. The idea being that the sales proceeds from the sale of those condos will be enough to cover the conversion costs. That's our hope anyway. I know the board understands that, but when if you were just developing condos that wasn't going to be kept in the portfolio of the LMI and all, and all these units were individual, then there are rates that are set that you cannot sell the unit for more than. I believe it's about 268000 or so now, but it depends on the family size, family size and the mean and income target. But you can't build a house now in this environment for 268,000 and sell it. So if, if they were not, if they were LMIs and they were let go at condos or at the rent that is gonna be charged for affordable housing, you can never make them meet. And you could try to carry that building if you weren't also trying to carry a senior center but the fluff in any development is already taken up by making sure we have a class A uh, senior center for everybody. Uh, that just doesn't leave any more room, right? That's correct. And there's some possibilities that the engineering on that building will not even allow it to be done. So it's not a, it, at the end, it, it's going to be somewhat like we did at Newport Beach Club PUC, PU Day, that building may be approved, but it's not mandated. You know, some of the, 
sometimes we do PUD, you must build this and you must build that. That's going to be not a priority of what is done here. It's not we're doing the market and then we'll do the LMI. This is all about this LMI building and the senior center. And then if the funds allow and if the market allows, we'll move our attention to that building as a secondary without the obligation to do it. And I'll also say again, I've said it on the record uh, before, that if there is any surplus proceeds from the sale of those market rate condos, that, those will just become sources to the uh, affordable housing and senior center costs. Um, you know, we're limited by uh, the, the funders in terms of what we can earn as a developer's fee. And so that is what it is. Um, the, the, there won't be any, you know, surplus sales proceeds coming from those market rate condos that'll go into, you know, church community housings accounts. It would all just become a source to the overall development, just so you know. And there's really, quite frankly, the only reason we're doing that is not in our mission to create market rate condos. We're just doing it because we want to try it. We want to see the Ann Hutchinson School preserved and put into a, a you know, a, a highest use possible and get it back on the tax rolls and, uh, and just see it, you know, preserved because uh, there aren't that many four room schoolhouses left in New England. And so that's, that's the plan that we have to accomplish that. Um, it, it, you know, depending upon where the market is by the time we get through permitting and are at that point where, you know, we're looking at construction costs and what the market the expected sales proceeds of those condos in, it, it, it may not work. You may end up handing the keys back to the town for that building, but uh, our desire definitely is to um, to save the school uh, through this this avenue. Uh, I'll say the same is true with the the ball field as well. You know, it, it has our, been our goal to save the ball field for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. But we have not completed the engineering for the septic system, for the drainage, for uh, you know all of the site engineering is not done, and so. It, it is possible that uh, a relocation of the ball field on that site uh, just doesn't work. Um, if that turns out to be the case, my understanding is that the town was planning on, on building a new ball field somewhere else anyway to replace that ball field. That may end up being what happens. It's not our preferred scenario. Obviously, you know, I would really rather have the ball field than the kids playing ball there on site with the, um, the seniors. Uh, but I just have to you know, be upfront and transparent that these are things that will only be determined as we continue down the road with engineering and further design. And that was put on the record in front of the council as Multiple well. times, yeah. This was a bonus actually, because it wasn't supposed to happen. And it was really a conversation with me that the ball field wasn't used. And I said, I drive that field yeah. every Saturday and it's filled with all the it's not only the little league field, it's the littlest of them. It actually is the best one to have in your neighborhood because it's just the eight year olds and nine year olds because it's a small field. So with that said, could you introduce uh, the team that you put together and then we'll just show you some things quickly. And Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Atman and Alana Jaworski from Union Studios Architects and Mike Darvo from Darvo Surveying. And also with us are Chris Schutz and Elizabeth Houle, their project managers with the church community. So back to there's nothing like a visual. So, and again, many of you may have seen this, whether it was part of your referendum package or whether it was in the newspaper or whether it was in the council. Great, okay. Hi, I'm Paul Atman. I'm a senior associate at Union Studio Architecture and Community Design in Providence. I live at 65 Church Street, Warren, Rhode Island. So across the bridge, not far from here. Um, I'm going to keep this brief. I think you've already seen uh, some of the collateral that we submitted and I'll walk you through a little bit of the project. If I can advance the slide. There we go, sorry. Uh, we were founded in 2001 with the sole purpose of using our skills as architects and urban designers to make civic contributions to communities of all types. We're about 25 to 27 employees in Providence and one in Philadelphia. 
And we are mission-based, uh, using our power of design to enrich lives and strengthen communities of all sorts. And th th those are lived through a lot of our projects, civic projects, which is on the upper left, the Tiverton Public Library, uh, student housing in Middlebury up on the upper right, urban planning and revitalization, as well as affordable housing uh, throughout Rhode Island and Massachusetts, um, and institute or commercial and uh, private work as well. So I think I'll walk through a little bit of the site uh, understanding. You're all very familiar with it. It's not far from here. It's up on Bristol Ferry Road, past the intersection with Sprague Street and 114. Looking closer at it, it's on the corner of Brownell Lane and Bristol Ferry Road. The existing uh, building is further up on the sloping site uh, along Bristol Ferry Road with the ball field toward the back. This here is an existing site survey showing the, the details and the grading of what is there now. There's an existing building which was added on to in about 1950s uh, to add some more classrooms to the school. And that portion now is the uh, Portsmouth Senior Center. Looking at this a little bit closer on the north property line, there's a heavy vegetative buffer as well as to the very westerly property line, but that's the sloping downhill side of the site. There's some very nice sunset and water views uh, of Narragansett Bay. And then there's the baseball field that anchors the middle of the site with the Abachi courts and a memorial garden in the, up in the northeast corner. What's interesting about this site and the, the vehicular act access is it, there's a lot of it. Two points of access off of Bristol Ferry Road, which is a very fast road uh, with north and southbound traffic. And then there's two curb cuts along Brownell Lane. And in our proposal, we've tried to minimize the amount of traffic and really consolidate points of entry and uh, egress from the site. Let's see. Okay, here's some photos, early photos of when the school was first opened uh, back in 1928. And the, the floor plan, as Christian mentioned, it's a four room schoolhouse, very traditional. Some existing pictures. The one story flat roof area is that addition that I mentioned that was added on in the 50s. It's in very poor shape, leaky roofs, cracked walls. Uh, very poor ADA accessibility. The, uh, actually, the current accessibility is on the north end of the uh, building, uh, not at the primary entrance to the building. So the proposal is to begin by that de the demolition of that. One, well, I shouldn't say that. We're going to work out a phasing because eventually that uh, north addition will be demolished. And the the four school, uh, the four room schoolhouse will be converted into the six units of market rate condos here on the on the corner. So the the site, the plan that we've developed is to really, as I mentioned, to really focus uh, egress and uh, ingress into the site with one curb cut off of Bristol Ferry Road that services the senior housing and the senior center, and then egress. You can also enter it off the, on, from the south side along Brownell Avenue. The market rate condos would have their own reconfigured parking in the front of the building with their own entrance off of Brownell Road. The existing ball field will be relocated to the southwest corner. And as Christian mentioned, we'll be working through the engineering stormwater and the, um, sorry, the, the touch pad's a little finicky. Uh, and I'll go back to there, uh, and also the septic, which will probably be located in the northwest corner of the site. There's also another easier access point for uh, serviceability for the um, senior center on the north side, with a trash pickup and enclosure on the north side of the property, and some additional convenience parking. As Christian mentioned, we've worked with the Portsmouth Senior Center to consolidate 
and relocate and reimagine the senior center in a much more uh, efficient layout and much more adaptive to their needs, but also integrated into the new build of the senior housing. And this plan shows that the, the, what the first floor plan on the upper right, how would that uh, integrates with the site with the senior amenity spaces in the lower right-hand corner, which would be the south uh, east corner, and then with this additional senior center uh, amenities uh, up in the north part of the building. And then the rest of the first floor is housing. The, on the left-hand side, you can see the second and third floors that are proposed, uh, predominantly one bedrooms, there's a total of 41 bedrooms and 14 two bedrooms for a total of 54 affordable senior apartments. That, those two floors then are, are span over the entire first floor. So the second and third floors of let's say the head piece of the building are over the proposed senior center. Uh, we did, I just, I'm we're showing you the existing uh, floor plan of the existing senior center. We did an anal analysis of all their spaces that they use and in terms of square footages, their functions and their relationships that helped us with the working committee to inform a better and more improved and efficient senior center that is on the first floor of the new building. As you can see, there's a dividing line to the left of residential, which we don't show on this partial floor plan, because this was as far as we brought the, the, the plans with the working group to uh, as, a, as a starting point when we begin more of the engineering and the detailed uh, construction documents. Uh, this here is an early rendering of what that building would look like. And as uh, was mentioned earlier, it is a three-story building, but the third story would be designed to be within a a, the roof or in the attic. So it seems to be from the street and other parts of the site and Brownell Street as a, uh, perceived as a two and a half story building, not a three story building. So I'm not sure if we should have uh, Mike mention it, talk to, about site engineering. I, I think we haven't really given much uh, attention to that at this point. Well, we'll, we'll be back over all yeah. the engineering. I really think conceptually, this is what everybody sees tonight. Um, we just want to provide one clarification. You mentioned the phasing. Um, and, you know, originally when we started working with Senior Center Advisory Group, uh, our first thought was that we were going to build the senior housing right off of the back of the existing senior center. Um, but when the senior advisory group learned that that would mean that uh, they would need to close up shop um, while renovations were occurring, when construction was happening, they uh, were like, well, that's not ideal. And so the, the current plan is to build the new building first, build the new senior center and the senior housing first so that the senior center can stay open in its current capacity for the duration until a new senior center is completed and they can move over immediately without any interruption in their operations. And then following that, that's when the portion of the building that was added in uh, the early 1960s would be demolished um, because it's just too far gone. And the renovation and conversion to the four room schoolhouse to market rate condos would begin. And that was an important consideration with the senior center staff that they didn't want to be uh, homeless or find temporary housing in the interim period of, of how long it would take to build a new building. But we'll be here with not only construction phasing reports, but time, the LMI ordinance has us actually tell you what our construction schedule is, time we start, anticipated time to finish those things. So that's pretty much the site layout. Uh, we do expect neighbors to have some input. Uh, another thing I noticed that that driveway on the backside certainly may be a contention, but some of this stuff, again, we'll have to determine if changes to it would be substantial. I think making some 
um, concessions if it needs to be for neighbors that aren't substantial is still possible to do, but it has to be substantially similar to what we have here. Timing wise, uh, we have to put everything together for you to meet not only the checklists of a special use permit, but the LMI. And that means the actual renditions and the drawings and actual site plans at least needs the engineering. It doesn't necessarily mean a full DEM approval, but it means uh, the design for the septic system that we expect to be done subject to that approval uh, and the permits. We have to, uh, there'll be some Bristol Ferris State Road, so there'll be some uh, state permits. Notice that right now it's going to be pretty easy for those of you that hopefully because the entire front of this property is an open thing that they probably want to close. I think it's got three or four openings at 50 feet wide a piece, and then there's another two on Brown L. So we don't, we anticipate almost every current situation getting a little better. Uh, there is a criteria, you know, one of the reasons tonight is to get some guidance. Again, this is a, a little bit of what has been told to the council and things, but one of the A through J criteria is that we, one of the A through J criteria is that we um, don't create traffic hazards. And one of the ways that that's somehow done, is, it's, it's done with a traffic count. Sometimes the zoning board requires us to do that. And sometimes they don't. You can reserve your right if everybody um, complains and wants it, they are expensive. Um, we're an LMI trying to fit very tight budgets. If it comes up, you can do it. If you know you want it in advance, then better to do it now than to have to continue in the middle of a uh, uh, petition to take 30 days normally for the traffic counts at least to be, to be done. Uh, there are some traffic counts that have been done in that area for the club and for Newport Beach Club over the years. They're not as fresh as maybe they could be, but they do exist. So we, do, we are looking for some guidance in that area. Ultimately, it's up to the board. You can, if you see it as complicated, either by technical review, by driveway layout or, or septic or building, uh, ask for a technical review. You, you can have a subcommittee if you wanna do it. We stand here trying to get this moving with a comprehensive permit. But right now we're the delay because we're not necessarily ready. So if there's a technical review committee, we'll be ready for it if that's what the board wants. Uh, if you find it complicated in the middle of it, I think you have the right to kick it to that as well. But if you anticipate it now, you, we just like marching orders that we can follow. We don't necessarily have a strong opinion on how you wanna go forward. I, we're not trying to cut corners. We're just trying to do it right and to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to have every question answered that could, that could come up, but also in a reasonable way, because it's not all that complicated. It's a fairly straightforward project. Anything else, Mr. Chappelle? I believe that's all we have for tonight. I'll just sort of restate what the court just said, which is that you know we haven't proceeded with the, the engineering work because we wanted to get your input so that we knew what direction to go in, um, you know, what other studies we may need to, to commission. Um, and so, you know, based on what you tell us tonight, we'll, uh, you know, proceed uh, following that guidance, whatever it may be. If you have any questions. Thank you. So before I take questions from the board members, I'd just like to ask Mr. Crosby if, if he had any particular opinion after being in this business for so long, either on the traffic or the TRC question that was posed, if you could offer your opinion, Gary. Um, I th think that in, in as a matter of um, um, caution on the, the that perhaps you would want to think about those things, but um, it's entirely up to you. I think that um, certainly design review board would want to be seeing this and um, it's it's up to you about a set, uh, uh, about traffic and about um, technical review committee whether you have the uh, uh, expertise or whether you feel like um, you can understand what they're doing to 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 be able to proceed. Okay. Board members. 
Mr. Mr. Pallott, we'll start on your end. How's that? Uh, on the traffic, I think uh, maybe account might be, um, like they said, it's expensive or whatever, but maybe um, more of an analysis based on, you know, what are the, what are the, what is the traffic that's being added by this development versus what's existing there? Cause that's kind of what the, the traffic impact is, you know, the, the pre-build post-build kind of conditions. So maybe some sort of statement from your consultant saying, you know, this is what we expect to generate as far as trips that might, that might be enough, you know, to kind of waive the, the, the traffic impact analysis. And we certainly have all the engineering for sight line studies, where the driveways are, distance to lights, all of that information that you consider every time we have these. Is there any design consideration as far as like um, access of, you know, unique vehicles to, to the senior center? Like, you know, there's probably going to be some, you know, ambulances and fire trucks and, you know, is there any like ride pickups planned, you know, from the, the you know, the Department of Transportation to access we'll ride and we'll be prepared and I'll, I'll be prepared to do that. Also remember that one of the criteria for the application is that we submit to the, to the fire department. So the fire department, as far as ambulance, emergency buildings, um, emergency vehicles, fire, fire engine, those things, they're going to make sure all our roads are wide enough. They're going to make sure we have the turning radiuses. They're going to make sure we have the proper hydrant facilities and they get a letter or give a letter eventually to what is normally the zoning board that they have reviewed the plans and don't see any issues or would like you to consider the following. So that's gonna cover some of that. The police department does the same. Um, police department doesn't usually have a number of issues with this, but they may have issues regarding the distance from a ball field to, to elderly housing or whatever input Mr. Peters wants to have. Uh, Mr. Woodhead from Department of Transportation was already on the committee and, and, and had some input in uh, facilities and things like that, but he will also have a letter or a presentation as part of our presentation saying that from Department of Transportation's opinion, this uh, petition should receive a positive recommendation. So a lot of that stuff that's going to get covered indirectly is the traffic count itself that wouldn't be at this point but some you know as we as we recognize sometimes people come and challenge very specific things and there's a room of people full of people that are addressing traffic we understand if we have to go get one what i don't want to do is to have you look at us and say because why weren't you smart enough to go get that done and my client will get me know, why don't we just spend five grand because we don't know that it's necessary if it is i guess we can reserve the right to do it if you want it now and we'll do it now, but I kind of appreciate that, that we'll give everything but, if you will. And I'll try to get some of it. I think you know that um, I know those Bristol Ferry counts were done fairly recently for a couple other petitions that we were involved with. Yeah, I know there's like a square footage um, trips conversion rate. So maybe just by using that, you could say, this is what we're producing now. This is what we're producing post-development. I, I don't think it's going to be that much. No, and that, I know yeah. we can do that because every time that we have a <clears throat> traffic engineer in the field, they have one bedroom senior housing generates per day, three bedroom kid houses generates per day, right. courts house 67 trips per day. <laughs> yeah. uh, I just have two more quick questions. Uh, I didn't see anything on the site plan for stormwater management. And as you know, we, we love our stormwater management here. And I'm, I know that's part of the engineering, but it would, you know, it makes us feel better if you actually see something reserved for that versus not having anything at all. Cause then it's like, oh, where are we going to jam this thing in? So that's definitely to come. And, and when okay. we come, all the drainage counts to support it, that's stuff that yeah. certainly we have to also give the zoning board. And they, they usually refer that over. Here. You can use it to irrigate the ball field. And uh, my last comment would just be, uh, it might be nice to have like a walking path around the perimeter of the property, you know, to for people to kind of get out and it looked like it was sort of intrinsic to the parking areas. It would be nice to get a path around the whole thing that, you know, but just throwing it out there, not, not a requirement. I'll, yes. see, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I, um, we're already sort of pushing the envelope with uh, the amount of funding that will be required to go to create the new senior center. Um, that's a, a long path around the perimeter, but uh, we'll certainly 
keep our eyes open for funding opportunities that might be able to accomplish that. So as I understand that in human's terms, the financing for senior housing is X dollars per unit. They don't allow you to fund housing and to put a million dollars worth of amenities because that's not what LMI housing is all about. So there's an exact ratio. That ratio is why when you saw the presentation of the senior center amenities that were part of the building and the separate senior center that was part of the town, that's because the maximum we could do under senior center the amenities with housing is this much square footage. So we put it here. And then that extra stuff that we're doing with private money, we did for the housing here. Combined, they make a very nice large thing. It's all of the members of the Senior Citizen Center will be able to use the amenities of this building and the amenities of this building will be members of the Senior Center. So in the world of reality, it doesn't matter, but in the world of financing, that's why you see it in two pieces. Right. And that's what he means by an extra amenity and thing, if that's $30,000 might take off 20 square feet over here. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue that we're up against. But that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, there's, um, you know, as I pointed out, a thrift store and offices for a senior center or senior center staff is not spaces that would typically be constructed in an affordable senior housing development. And so that's why we broke out that portion of the new senior center as the senior center condo that the town would own and then lease to the senior center uh, organization. Um, because that's that's where the thrift shop is housed, where the offices are housed. And then also, um, it's where the kitchen and the fitness center are located as well, because we realized through our work with the Senior Center Advisory Group that those were spaces that you would want to have more control over, that shouldn't be open 24 hours a day, because God forbid, if one of the uh, residents of the senior housing development were to injure themselves working out in the fitness room and the senior center staff had all gone home for the day and nobody was there to be able to respond to that. So that portion of the senior center building that's identified as the senior center condo would be uh, you know, controlled by the senior center group and be able to be locked and at the end of the day when the senior center group so that the thrift store and all the contents can be secured so that, uh, that there isn't uh, activities that are unsafe uh, for the residents happening after the senior center staff have left. And so as Cora alluded to, um, we anticipate applying for community development block grant funds to cover the cost of that component of the building identified as the senior center condo. And we're pretty much maxing out the amount that uh, we believe they'll be willing to fund for that. Uh, and so then to ask for more money to do the path around here, just not, there are limits. Most might, most path might work. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely try. Anything else, Mr. Blot? How about Mr. Tippett? Uh, thank you, yeah, and you uh, you did answer a few of the questions I might've had through the discussion, so thank you. Um, just uh, tying back into the, trying to consolidate points of entry, I can see you're, you're, you wanna keep the condos separated, I'm looking. Uh, more to the west of that, the 26 spaces. I'm just curious if that loading uh, considers and is based on public, you know, traffic using the baseball thing. I, I know, I, I think I hear the concern and I see the topography. So that baseball thing may not, may not ever happen. So I'm just kind of curious if it's designed out, if that affects your loading or if that's uh, how that's considered. Well, the good I can tell you that the baseball field right now utilizes, has probably all the parking in the world because they utilize all the pavement around the building. Um, but it's Saturday morning, which generally aren't consistent with our loading times and zoning times. And we are in control of our loading times so that we can make sure they're not Saturday morning. There really isn't much use of that. The field, um, whether it's owned by us or the town, uh, there's actually a good process in town. We have to sign up for these fields. There's time so you don't get there when it's not there. So the town and the little league that has rights to it controls that. So Saturday mornings, you know, there's randomly there's a kid and his dad that goes out there and throws balls. And I'm not overly concerned with that parking. It's when you have a playoff game that every parent goes to and there's 30 or 40 spots. 
we need to be able to show you that we looking to design a system which doesn't leave that all on Brown LA and that can enable it. Come okay. on. <laughs> And, and then uh, just one other thanks um, to the discussion of the long-term lease and it contingent on it being a substantially similar to that approved by the referendum. Are there any concerns you have, you know, however I define substantial or you define substantial, are there any big concern takeaways at this point with there's Not nothing proposed at all that's different from okay. what we did. So right now we started with this is exactly what we saw. So if you granted it, there would be no substantial change. But, you know. Uh, Through design to understand that will evolve. I just want to make sure. If somebody wants a dumpster moved to a different spot, for instance, and we have to redo some things, I'm not calling that substantial. Uh, I'm calling that some accommodations in a special use permit that the board is allowed to do to try to minimize effect on neighbors. If it came to a point where you had to get rid of the senior center, that's substantial, right? Or we were adding to make it bigger. Clearly any building size difference I think is substantial. Um, clearly any amenity that we've promised that is canceled is substantial. Clearly we qualified that the ball field would be there if possible. Um, so I don't think that's substantial because it's pre-qualified that it wouldn't be. Um, but if engineering drainage takes up 20 spots or 30 spots and we need a super large variance, it would be the reason we lost the ball field, not the reason that there's a substantial change because we're creating parking hazard. So I don't really anticipate that there's going to be uh, that, that many, but I, I did want to bring it to your attention that it's here after all the King's men and all the King's horses negotiated to get it looking like it is already. So we bind you. That's what went to the town, went to the council. I would like to think it has their blessing. Interesting, remember if the town owns this, no zone owns it. And there was actually debates or discussions on whether when a private entity leases it from the town, is the town owned or this? And clearly the safest thing and the right thing is to put it through the zoning. But again, if it was just town owned, we leased it from them as opposed to us owning the building. There wouldn't be no zoning application or planning. And I, I just say for our own uh, comfort level, whenever there's something, even the relocation of a uh, dumpster, um, we're going to be checking with the town to see if they de deem it to be a substantial change to the plans because if they deem it to be a substantial change, then we don't have a ground lease. And without the ground lease, we don't have any land to build it on. So, you know, we're definitely going to be very cautious about changes and ensuring that it, it does not uh, exceed the, the town's interpretation of a substantial change. And that may be just one thing that we don't usually have and say time out before you vote, close the meeting. May we go to the council and say, these are the recommendations that the planning board is seeking to put in. Can I have a finding <laughs> substantial or do you, do you have any issue with it being substantial? And we'll seek Kevin to see if that's the case. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Tibbetts? Ms. Wilson. Um, just when you're designing this thing, just remember there are different, uh, uh, things like pervious pavement that might help. And if you don't have to put a drainage uh, basin in the back, and if you could do it in the pavement, you know, collect the water there, it'd probably be a wash. But um, remember, there are certain things that can help you know, move this along, especially with permits for environmental. And of course, it would be a DOT CAPA, but I think there would be a problem with that. Anything else? Okay, Mr. Harding. And just a, okay. can you turn your, yeah. your mic on? First of all, I love the whole idea of the whole thing. Uh, just out of curiosity, the marketplace building. How does that, you know, like the cutting of the grass and the plowing of the parking, 
for those particular units, are those the town taking care of it or no, they? It's an HOA. Okay. The HOA fee with the the condos that would you know be calculated to include the costs of maintenance and plowing and all of that. So that grass area and the parking in the front becomes their headache. It'll have to be an individual condo document for the common owners of those six units and then would identify what is unique to that building that would go into a condo association fee or HOA just for that building. And then to the extent there was overlap, think of Equidnik where the gate, for instance, is a little bit taxed to everybody, but certain areas are only taxed to one of the sub condos like the tower concierge. So would have a master plan. And if there's a agreement that everybody pays X for snow plowing, that will all be part of the documents that we generally submit as either maintenance, like a maintenance plan for a detention area. Yeah, sure. Spread out between everybody. Just another uh, couple of questions. <clears throat> I'm sure there's a good reason. When Cary School was converted, the most expensive, the nicest condominiums were what was the attic conversion. Uh, the view from up on that roof, which I've happened to be on, is spectacular. Uh, I just always envisioned what I went inside that attic if there had been a deck cut in and condominiums. If so, if those were able to be developed with there, there would be your money for your path around the, the building. <laughs> I, and, and I actually had I had absolutely the same reaction when I got into the attic. Um, our contractor that's been helping us with construction estimates uh, did not immediately see a viable uh, attic conversion, but it's definitely something I'm going to continue yeah. to pursue because like you, it, I think those condos with those views would be really terrific. I mean, if you just, I, I would get somebody from BN Brothers to take you for a tour of what they did down at Cary School and what was involved since they were, it would be money, time well spent to, to see it. And last but not least, and I, and I think you guys have already been touching on it, uh, the trash enclosure happens to be almost next to the house of the people that live next door. And, and if you parked in the last parking place closest to that, you don't even have the ability to back up. To, to, so it would move even further to be right next to their house. And I would think to avoid a battle if there's any place ahead of time. That My bet is one of the reasons I specifically meant, mentioned that is not a substantial change was because I saw that. Yeah. And not an old Radamus, but I've been standing in front of this board for a long time. That is going to be something that I expect would come up. I think it's a reasonable request of the neighbor. And when it does, we've already discussed, I believe we're going to have an alternative plan. We put this forward today because I thought we had to do the same and nobody raised it. Yeah. But those of us that sit in these and ironically, often one of the one change. of the people that started church community, his her brother had that house for many years and his son lives there right now. So he'd have the pleasure of listening to the garbage trucks on the dumpster right next to his house would not be good karma. So we'll just definitely bring it take up. a look at it. All right, that's all I had. All right, thanks Luke. Mr. Garso. I, I think it's pretty nice, but you know, I, I'd be curious to see how, if you're gonna designate parking to residents as opposed to the folks that are just going to the senior center and the people that go to the store, et cetera, and the ball field, like, is it just a first come first serve or will yeah, the people I, living there have designated spots and it will, like that? Um, we'll show you the numbers, but we own approximately 250 units of elderly affordable housing at seven different locations and the, the parking demand is uh, less than one car per two units. So at a 54 unit development, we expect there to be approximately 25 cars associated with those 54 units. So a really insignificant, just senior affordable housing, the, the parking demands are just very minimal compared to pretty much every other use. Um, so I, I don't, I don't envision there being a lot of fighting over parking spaces, particularly because um, you can see where the entrance to the housing 
uh, portion of the development is. I think uh, most of the residents are going to be parking um, in that western part of the lot, and the spaces nearest the senior center um, will most likely just because of the design of the, the building uh, will be open for people, the members of the senior center who are attending. Do you see, see where there might be more entrances added to the building? Like say on the west end, uh, as opposed to just from that one side, there's yeah, just one entrance? It, it's, it's possible. We'll have to look at the, the hallway lengths and fire exit requirements. And um, it, it, it could it's definitely something we'll look at and figure out if we need to add more entrances. I think Dave, to it, you hit 55 and over and you think of maybe like the Tiverton Starworks, which isn't really LMI and has a completely different clientele than are normally in his uh, 250 LMI units there. Generally, single. average age is uh, 66 years old. They are almost, you know, the, the vast majority are um, single women who have outlived their husbands. <laughs> so, uh, two cars, all right. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we certainly, and again, part of this meeting is I think it is important because our ordinance for shared parking says. I want you to start by calculating what you need for parking for the senior center based on square footage because it's in our ordinance. And then based on what you need on a per unit basis, and then maybe what you need on a ball field and say, if these were independent, this is what you'd need for all three. Here's what we have and while it's works. And then you decide if that shared parking arrangement is enough. Some things and to consider is like if the baseball field is Saturday morning, well, that's good because we don't have a loading zone. That's not necessarily the senior setters at most active time. They tend to be nine to five, I think, on Monday through Friday or nine to seven Monday through Friday. Uh, I'm not certain of the closing time. Off the top of my head. Well, but we'll have all that for you. I think that's a, those are valid. And, and again, the, this we know. If we get rid of a baseball field, we have all the parking we need to advance. And to try to save the baseball field, and it may even be a consideration that we'll try this. And if it does not work, the planning board reserves the right to say, we're going to have to remove that baseball field and put in parking if it becomes a problem. That's always a possibility as well with a review. But parking became more of an issue when we tried to save the acreage for that field. But that's part of our job to convince you that there's going to be enough. or collectively there's not going to be enough and we'll have to make adjustments to the field that has been eliminated. Anything else, Dave? You good? So I, I just had a I, I kind of echo my fellow members comments. I I love the look, the kind of the blend of the old and new. I, I think the fabric of it is is really neat. And I like the way you've incorporated the third story into the roof line. I think that that's really nice. I, I did have a Kind of echo Mr. Harding's comments about the dumpsters. You got one in the front yard here, which I don't really go for either. So maybe that's something you could work on. Court's got that for Remember action. all that was done. <laughs> and then, and my last question is: You mentioned the condo regime for the for the existing buildings. So six units are going to be in there. Are they going to own those in fee simple, or are they going to be under the ground lease as well? And it's just kind of a just yeah, curious. no, they would have to be on the on the eight separate ground lease as well. Okay, so you've carved that piece out then. Got it. But the entire ground is going to remain owned by the town. It's not okay. Got it. All right. So just a some recap as I was making notes here. So you'd ask some questions, Court. I, I think one of them is design review board. I'm I'm not speaking for the board, but it sounds like from an architectural standpoint, you probably want to get in front of them. And and we don't object to that. I think technically the comp permit talks about one board not right. doing all that, but that's really for time. And to go to design review, we have what we need for design review right. and we need time to do some of the more for the engineering. They're generally landscaping this. So because it doesn't cost time, there was, was no reason in the world not to get their input and we would be happy to do that. Great. I'll do it contemporaneously. Sure. I think we'll, we won't be, at best we'll be back in two months. It may very well be today. 
Well, we're, we won't be on May, right? No, we won't be on May. I said summer, you know, that's too far away. Yes, <laughs> that's too much. Time flies. It? <laughs> Got it. Um, any questions? Any, I, we're not going to take a vote, obviously, because it's it's preconceptual. Okay. Um, any other questions from the board members? Any questions for us? No, the, the other thing is, I really don't know whether there's going to be 7,000 people in the complaining or supporting. But that's just the nature of our jobs these days. But if it become, if it starts to look like we should have an individual meeting, or I can put it on a meeting where we take up everybody else, and I ask the board to set an additional meeting, uh, I wonder if you'd consider that. If it sometimes these things go through, and and you know we've think, done things at Equinic, and, and that nobody shows up. And sometimes I did a golf course that I thought nobody would show up, and the 200 people in the room objected. So if it becomes something that warrants an individual meeting, I'd ask the. So again, I'm, I'm not speaking for the board, but I would consider that because I was just thinking of your timeline. I think June's going to be tight to come back and we typically don't meet in July, but I would think that if come the June meeting, you, we should consider a special meeting. I think we would take that under advisement because it's a very important project. So that's just my opinion. I, yeah, exactly. I, I think what will happen is yeah, we'll try to file by June with notice that it's only on for schedule so that we don't right. bring 12 witnesses and that a bunch of people that are behind us don't think that they're not going to get to And the meeting in June is early. I think it's the 8th. Yeah, it's so the first, second, yeah, that, second. that's a tight one. Well, we'll do the best. And if not, well, it's August and that's what we got. Is funding coming? based on what you get to a certain point? Or is there so much because of the condos there that it's going to be money generated that's going to help this move along? Uh, yeah, I mean, we there are really two things for funding. It's site control, which we have through the option for the ground lease, and it's permitting approval. And so um, we, in order to pass thresholds for the funding applications, um, we need to be able to show that we have at, a, at the least gotten through master plan with an approval and really you need preliminary plan approval to, um, to, to be seriously considered. So that creates one interesting thing because Kevin's reading of the ordinance, which I don't disagree with, our ordinance, the town of Portsmouth ordinance, uh, says LMI can be done if it's a subdivision through the subdivision regulations, which as we all know, are master and preliminary and final. But then it says, if it's not a subdivision through other town ordinances, and that's the zoning board and the special use permit with addition, the LMI criteria, if I'm saying it right, right, Kev? So when I told Christian that tonight, that we were talking about that, his concern is that funding applications that he's normally seen are all based on, do you have preliminary, do you have master, do you have that? So we're looking into whether or not they need to see it as a, a subdivision. I don't think it changes. We'll be here for a special use permit. And if you were granting it, let's say, can you also grant, remember the, there's the same notice, the same public master plan approval. And then rather than get a final approval, we'll come back for a preliminary final combined. So I think there's a way to skirt it if our funding requires and says, I don't care what the Portsmouth ordinance says, but in the state ordinance, I want this. Right. But we'll be prepared. Kevin and I and Gary will work that out. I thought we had, but we'll work that out before we get back here. And, and regardless what the determination is, as long as we can show the funders that the approval that we have is substantial, you know, everything but final, um, that will satisfy them. Because we have to have People have to be able to speak locally about it so it doesn't feel like it's rigged, but we don't have to drag it through all of the special yeah. and, and again, I, 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 the opinion I like it, I appreciate it, I think it's accurate. It just took him to Christian back, who's done so many of these, that he sees everybody normally plug them into the subdivision ordinance. He's just like, well, let me make sure my finance guy agrees with that. That's all. That's not claiming anybody's right or wrong, just came up tonight and he saw this issue. And I talked to Kevin, I thought it was all, 
about financing and put them in the room. I'd have to worry about them. <laughs> <laughs> I realize that's important. Yeah, typically um, the the big um, nine percent tax credit application, which is the the um, most important uh, source of funding for this type of development, typically that round is in December, and so that would really be when we would need to have you know that permitting that where where whatever form it takes, um, where we're you know we either have final approval decision in hand, or that's all we're waiting on and we've already gotten special use permit or master plan preliminary uh, at that point. So all right. unlike some, not as much for us as normally been done to our head, right? All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. All right, next on our agenda is the um, monthly status report. What's the pleasure of the board? Make a motion to uh, accept the uh, report subdivisions and flat recordings and place on file. There, a second, so we got a motion made and seconded by Mr. Tippett's and Mr. Harding. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. How about a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you.